Hey fellow babies, welcome back to the Pactor Factor on sifted.net. Uh, happy to have you here. Hope you are a Patreon patron and you're getting this stuff real time. If you uh, cannot afford to or choose not to contribute via Patreon uh, and you're watching on YouTube, please at least attempt to link your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. Um, if you have Amazon Prime and you link it to your Twitch account, then uh, Twitch Prime will pay us a couple of bucks a month and that'll help out to, you know, to defray the production costs. All right, let's get to uh, this week's questions. Our first question comes from Sifted from McWomble. Hey, McWomble, how you doing, brother? Um, Kojima told fans not to watch Death Stranding's Tokyo Game Show presentation, knowing that people can't get enough info about the game and will watch anyway. Can you think of another developer that is better at using media and social media to manipulate the press and consumers? That's interesting. He is really good. Um, but I would say, in fairness, he has Jeff Keighley, you know, amplifying everything he does. So I don't follow Kojima, but I do follow Jeff. And so Kojima can't do anything that Jeff doesn't retweet for him. Um, the truth is, of the developers I know, I'd say for real, and I don't think it's manipulative, but of the developers I know, Ed Boon's probably the best on social media. Um, Ed is, he lives and breathes, you know, Mortal Kombat and, he, you know, he's constantly um, keeping players up to date, offering codes, talking about characters, putting pictures up of cosplay. I mean, he's really actively involved. I think he genuinely is interested in his community. Um, and so, you know, I follow actually a bunch of developers and I don't think Kojima is better than, than these other guys. I just think Jeff amplifies it so an extra million people, you know, see it immediately. Um, <laughs> You know, as far as, again, use the word manipulate, I mean, you know, saying don't watch my, my video is pretty funny, I can't, or my presentation. I can't imagine that anybody would ever actually say that out of fear of people taking them seriously and not watching. Um, but I, I'm not sure that that game's gonna do well. I mean, I think it's gonna be really interesting to see. Well, it's weird, you know, and I didn't read the article, but today, uh, I think it was Games Industry put out an article Here's what Death Stranding is actually about. You know, which again, like, I think we're morbidly interested in it because it's the weirdest thing we've ever seen. Now, when I say that, um, I would say Final Fantasy is among the weirdest games I've ever seen. Uh, Katamari was one of the weirdest games I've ever seen, although I really liked it. I, I have no idea what I was doing, but it was fun. Um, and so I think that there is a genre of Japanese game that's just the weirdest game you've ever seen. And Death Stranding is kind of Kojima going back to those roots. Although he is very much a, a Japanese Western game maker. Like he's, he's always made Western-like games. Resident Evil, I mean, there are, there are a handful of Japanese games that really, really work well in the West that are Western style. And then there's these other Japanese games like Katamari that are very much Japanese and that's just what they are. And yet they work in the West for some reason. Death Stranding is, I think, Kojima's effort to go back to let's call it roots and, and try to make something that's kind of an in-between. I think it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. So I, I'm curious to see if it works. Um, he is very good at getting attention. And again, I think I think he genuinely cares for Jeff Keighley and I think Jeff genuinely cares for Kojima. But it, that's a great party, you know, a great relationship to have. A guy who's got a million followers and people kind of hang on every word, everyone to Jeff's word. So, Kojima's better than these other guys because he's got Jeff amplifying his message. You know, it, it's impossible for any human to completely divorce their personal preferences and their, and their affinity for other humans from their job. And so while a journalist endeavors to be impartial and fair all the time, you can't not like some people better than others that you work with. And so um, I want to say it's it's uh, Jim Lear of the McNeil Lear or now the the Lear News Hour on PBS. Stop voting! Literally, like 40 years ago, he doesn't vote in any election because he wants to interview candidates and not have anybody ever ask him who he voted for. And he, so he just thinks that's inappropriate for him to take a vote. I think that that's the goal of all journalists. But let's be real. Jeff has a great relationship with Gabe Newell. And because of his relationship, he gets better insight into what Valve is doing 
Unfortunately, Valve isn't doing much, but he, but Jeff had access. I remember the portal papers, like he really did have access to everything. And he's got access to Kojima, and, and I think that they give him access because they genuinely like him. I mean, I gotta say, I genuinely like him. So uh, is it inappropriate for him to amplify the message for friends? I don't think so. I, I think it would be inappropriate for him to do something negative and use his power to hurt somebody. And Jeff is really seriously universally liked. Now, I, there are people who might be jealous of him or maybe he didn't return a call and they think he's arrogant, but I don't find that to be the case at all. I think he's a warm, caring, really good guy. And the thing that blows me away, I don't know how he gets everything done in the same number of hours that I have in the day. He does 10 times as much as anybody. It's, I mean, it's crazy. So uh, no, I don't think it's inappropriate. I think it's, but, I, but ask me, does he genuinely love Kojima as a friend? Yeah, he really does. Our next question comes from Patreon from Julio Rodriguez. Julio. What a great question. How did Pactor Factor come to be and what was your first time meeting Shane? I don't remember my first time meeting Shane, but I mean, I could, cause I probably, well, I can tell you roughly within the three year period when it was. Pactor Factor came to be because there was a show on game trailers where Shane worked, a show on game trailers that started up called Bonus Round with Jeff Keighley. And it was filmed in LA cause game trailers was headquartered in LA. And I believe I was on the first episode. And the reason I think I was selected is not because I'm so handsome or so smart or actually prior to that, very entertaining, but I think it's because I was geographically desirable. I was in LA. That's uh, not true. Okay, good. Well, Shane, Shane will come on camera and do a voiceover and tell you. But anyway, I got invited on and I'm pretty sure it was me and Jason Rubin. And Jason was the founder of Naughty Dog. So we did the first bonus round, and apparently, the, the you know they were trying to figure out if it was a good format. It was just Jeff interviewing people, and they invited me back. And I probably did. Oh, I don't know. I think bonus round was was it weekly? Yeah. So bonus round probably taped 45 episodes a year. They probably skipped like Christmas and stuff. And I probably was on five or six times the first year, and maybe seven or eight the second year. And at the end of the second year, Jeremy Hoffman, who is now at Epic, approached me and he said, how would you like to do your own show, which we call The Pack Attack? And that was probably 2008 or so. And uh, Shane, I believe, was the head guy on video. So Jeremy worked for Shane, but I'm sorry. Jer yeah, Jeremy worked for Shane. So Jeremy was the producer. And I forgot the scrawny bald guy's name. He was actually super nice. And he only made like two episodes because the guy was like, I, you know, he wanted me to stand and he wanted me to have makeup and they wanted a wardrobe and I was supposed to read a script. And I, I was looking, I tried the first one. I went, this is stupid. I'm not doing this. We're doing Q&A. So, and they were like, no, that's not how we want to do it. And I go, okay, we'll then find somebody else. So we did Q&A. <laughs> And anyway, they ended up firing the guy pretty quickly into my tenure, maybe five episodes, four episodes in, and, well, probably one taping. And then uh, they replaced him with Rohan Rivas. So Rohan was my producer, my direct producer. Jeremy was there about half the time. And I, you know, I initially I went into uh, game trailers and then they started coming to my office. And so if you kind of go back and look at Pack Attack on, I think IGN has them now. Um, you can see I was always wearing a tie and I was in my office. The first and, 10 episodes of this show were in your office. Yeah, and so uh, and how many Maybe years? Maybe more, actually. How many years has this been on? Four years? Yeah. Yeah. So um, anyway, so I did it for, I don't know, a long time. I, at least a couple hundred episodes. Probably four, four years. And then Game Trailers got sold. And they got sold to... Defy. Defy Media. And... Uh, I had a conflict because Take-Two's CEO, Strauss Zelnick, had a controlling interest in the company that bought um, um, game trailers, and it was just, it was a potential conflict. I couldn't be promoting a product owned by a company that I cover, so I stopped doing it. And uh, so a, a short time passed, and then Shane approached me, probably a year, and then Shane approached me saying he was starting up Sifted and did I have any interest in starting doing it for them. 
and maybe it was two years. But anyway, so we started up then, and I was still. But you said no at first. Well, I was still going to the office, and yeah, and it was, it's a pain in the butt to do this. So I was still going to the office, and uh, we so we taped him in the office then. I started working at home and you know, Shane was like, no, it's better in your office with your suit and all your gimmicks and stuff. And we kind of very slowly just decided I'm not going to the office anymore. So now, <laughs> now you get t-shirts instead of suits. So that's how it started. We've pretty much been doing the same format for 10 years. I guess I've been doing it for 10 or 11 years. Um, but I took a couple of years off. So I think we have like 400 episodes or whatever. You know, so there's a lot out there. So. That's the answer. Yeah, I did probably 250-ish of uh, Pack Attack, yeah. and then 160 of this so far. So that's how it started, and I met Shane for sure on the game trailer set, because, and I probably met him during bonus round, but I actually don't remember the, that day. I mean, it wasn't like, didn't mean anything to me. I mean, I know him, and I knew him then, and I met all the rest of the game trailers guys too, and I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I met you uh, in person the first time when you came in to shoot at Game Trailers. On bonus round, probably. Yeah, yeah. well, when they were working on the pilot for Packet Oh, there you go. Okay. And then I started going on bonus round with you. Right. And we kind of built our friendship working together on bonus round. Yeah, because, I mean, you were, you were a... I was uh, the editor-in-chief. But you were also a talent on bonus right. round. Like, you did, you did your own show. And so, yeah, I mean, it's like, I don't remember how... I mean, it's like how I met Kyle, too. It's like I met everybody that worked there sometime in that time yep. frame. But I, you know, I, like I said, I was probably there six or seven times a year. And then when I had my own show, I was there 10 times a year, you know, so um, that's how I met everybody. But then I got him to come to my office. Now I have Shane coming to my house. So just like, it, life gets better and better and better. <laughs> and eventually we're just gonna do it with VR headsets and we're not going anywhere. Okay, our next question from YouTube from Michael Ovalle. Uh, with Sony recently acquiring Insomniac, isn't that awesome? Do you see any way that Microsoft might reunite with Bungie and purchase the studio? What an insightful question. The two relationships are kind of similar. Keep up the great work. Thank you very much. Um, you know, curious question, and I, I don't know if this came in after or before this happened, but um, this past week, like this week uh, of September 9th, um, Phil Spencer posted that, that on Mixer, he and Pete Parsons were playing Destiny, I guess Destiny 2, together. And you could watch it, and then they were gonna open up and play with other players. And so, I, look, 100% those guys were friends. And Bungie was part of Microsoft, and Phil's been at Microsoft for 22 years, 27 years, something like that. So 100%, they know each other and they love each other. But I found that very curious that they were playing Destiny together and Bungie's independent, and you know I, the Bungie deal with Activision unwound because Bungie didn't earn what they expected to earn on the deal, and they didn't get screwed, and they're not you know about to declare bankruptcy or or give up their homes. But I think everybody thought that this, the games would sell better than they did, and I think that Bungie expected to get a bigger profit than they than they earned, and so when they broke up. Um, Bungie essentially got back the IP and got the catalog and, and no further obligation on either side. But Bungie now needs marketing support and publisher support and honestly Microsoft's a good, a good partner. So um, at a minimum I would expect Microsoft to be the publisher of those games. Um, I don't know if uh, if Pete is willing to take Destiny and make it an Xbox exclusive. And so that's the better question. And the answer is if, if the money's right, it is something I think he would consider. So I did find them playing Destiny together really interesting. And I think your question maybe is a response to seeing the same thing I saw. But yeah, I think that makes sense. And you know, I think Insomniac has done only a couple of games that weren't PlayStation exclusive. Um, they did uh, they did Sunset Overdrive for Xbox, and they did um, Fuse. Fuse was multi-platform, right? Yeah, yeah, and that and that didn't do well. And then so, all the Oculus stuff that they did. Yeah, which was again small, but Fuse was multi-platform bombed. Sunset Overdrive was Xbox exclusive and did okay, um, but everything else they've done you know, has been PlayStation exclusive. So um, I, they've had an incestuous relationship with PlayStation, 
And I think that they did such a phenomenal job on, on Spider-Man that I think you know, Sony just decided we really need to own this. And I think Sony's actually smart about bringing t talent in-house. I mean, there's very few failures at Sony on buying studios. I mean, they really, they've been good. Um, and even the guys that you thought might not be good kind of come back and surprise you with really great games. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm utterly impressed with, with Sony as a partner. Microsoft needs more of that. The last five or six acquisitions have been great, but Microsoft, you know, pretty much ran rare into the ground and they ran was Peter uh, Molyneux's lion head into the ground. I mean, um, so you know, I, I ran into the ground. They'd lost talent and then the games kind of died and whatever. So they really need to get some great stuff back and I think Bungie would be awesome. Unrelated, but I, you, you don't know this. So um, I met with Marvel and I specifically spoke to them about the Spider-Man game and I asked them, was it exclusive PlayStation because Sony has the film IP? And they said, no. They said, we could have made that multi-platform. Sony does not have the rights to make video games based on, their, on the movie licenses they have. That Sony um, negotiated that separately. And we, Marvel, decided that was appropriate to put it on PlayStation only. And we were compensated for that. And it sold a gajillion units and we're happy. But no. Um, and Sony doesn't have the rights, like the next Spider-Man game could be multi-platform if Marvel decides it wants to be multi-platform. So the interesting thing is Insomniac won't make it for multi-platform. So I think exactly opposite what you said. They bought Insomniac to make sure the next Spider-Man game is PlayStation only because Marvel will very definitely want Insomniac to work on it and Insomniac being owned by Sony will keep that game off of Xbox. So I, so I think it's a very intelligent strategic move, but no, they, Sony doesn't have a right to keep that IP on PlayStation only, but if Insomniac makes it, they can say to um, Marvel, no, you can't port it, and if you want Insomniac to make it, it's PlayStation only, and Marvel has to then decide, do we trust EA or Activision with our IP? And the answer is they won't. All right, our last question this week from Sifted from Toast9. Recently, 2K got some bad press after sending over a couple of goons to the house of an alleged leaker of Borderlands 3 information. Then they abused copyright strikes on his YouTube channel and otherwise harassed him, spurring a boycott of the game. Do boycotts ever hurt sales? What's your take on this sort of behavior in 2K? Isn't 2K essentially punishing someone for doing their job? Okay, my understanding, and I obviously can't know if any of this happened this way, is that the kid um, did good detective work, found publicly available information about Borderlands 3 that had not been released to the public but was accessible if you went through a connected series of, of internet links. And he just did good digging. And uh, so clearly some sloppy behavior on the part of people who had information on Borderlands posting videos that they thought were protected to one another, but they didn't protect them properly, and he didn't hack anything. He just found the information. And I want to be fair to 2K. They clearly thought the guy violated copyright, so they clearly thought he stole it. And the plausible explanation, which again, I don't have any knowledge or information that this is correct, but I think it's probably right. The kid didn't do anything illegal, but the 2K side was, well, no one's supposed to post this, so the kid must have hacked it. So they believed he was bad, we believe he wasn't, and they went and harassed somebody because they thought he stole. And I completely understand that. And I guess the, the right question is, if you think someone stole from you, should you call the police? And the answer is, yes, you should. And if you're wrong, then the police don't take any action. So let's get to the second half of your, your question. You know, a couple of goons, he sent private investigators. They have a right to ask him. I think if he had done what he should have done and shown them, here's how I got this information, they should have concluded no harm, no foul. I don't know what he said to them. I he don't know what they said. We, well, we allegedly, we don't know. And so the, I mean, the fair answer is if they understood that he accessed this information appropriately, they should have backed down. If they understood that and didn't back down, then they misbehaved. 
and they should they should be censured. But I just don't know. So so the news reporting is he told them, and then they issued copyright strikes against him anyway, which is wrong. Um, is the material copyrighted? Yes. Do they have a right to keep you from republishing it? Yes. Even if what he found was available legally, they can still issue copyright strikes. He can't republish the information. So I don't, you know, abusing it, it is their IP. They have the right to do that. Do, do I think they were heavy handed? If they understood that he had accessed it appropriately, they were heavy handed. But the point is they should take down all these URLs. They, I think it's completely appropriate for them to say, take down the posts that you made, you know, the YouTube videos you made. But I don't think you harass him any further because once you find out that what he did was innocent, you just say, okay, fine, please take it down. But they don't have to get nasty. They just have to say, this is copyrighted material, please take it down. And the, I think, understand that this kid was like a, a fan and would have taken it down. So yes, they're punishing, punishing someone for doing their job. Um, and, and, and this is, again, this is where you cross the line. If the guy misappropriated copyrighted uh, material and republished it, but but the way he misappropriated it was finding it posted on the internet, he didn't break the law. It's still a copyright violation. The, there's no way they can punish him and get any damages, get paid by him for damage because he found it innocently and he reposted it thinking it's out there. But they absolutely can say take it down. And you know, I, I had a funny uh, experience with game trailers, God, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. In my office, I had a, a stuffed Pikachu that Nintendo sent to me as, you know, with some Pikachu game, some Pokemon game. So I had this really fun, furry, you know, pink cheek Pikachu behind me. And Nintendo actually contacted us and asked us to take the video down because we had inappropriately used their IP. And it was just behind me in the video. I didn't mention the word Pikachu. But they, they're like a likeness of a Nintendo character, and we actually take that video down. Do you kind of vaguely remember that? Oh, I know all yeah. that. Yeah. So, I still have that same stuffed animal. Yeah. It's him sitting on top of a Pokeball. Yeah, I still have it too. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that was, uh, yeah. So, you know, I think that it's entirely appropriate for 2K to rigorously protect their IP. I do believe that when they were sent out there, when they went out there to interview him, they believed he stole it. And so I think that all is, is appropriate behavior. But I think that they, once he explained to them that he didn't, I think it's incumbent upon them to be polite and work with him and flexible to take it down without having to file copyright strikes. That, that's, so, you know, it's, I mean, I, I, again, my understanding is they did overreact. But I do understand this is valuable IP. This game is gonna do probably, you know, 500 million in revenue, 600 million in revenue. You don't want to screw that up. Um, a boycott of the game, I don't know. If any company does something you don't like, then it is entirely appropriate to not buy their products. Uh, you know, that's, and if a company does something you do like, then you should buy more of their products. So, you know, I think that that's the only way consumers can express satisfaction or dissatisfaction is vote with your wallet. And so again, do I think that's appropriate? Yeah. If you're pissed at them, then don't buy their game. Um, the fact is that, you know, Gearbox didn't do a bad job making Borderlands and Gearbox doesn't deserve to be penalized. And, you know, the, the publisher is the one who sent out the investigators and the publisher is protecting their pecuniary interests and that's their, that's their job. So I actually think everybody in this story did the right thing. It's just that, you know, the kid maybe should have understood that he wasn't actually supposed to get that, but God bless him for being diligent and, and poking around. And 2K shouldn't have been heavy handed, but they, it's their job to protect their IP. So, you know, everybody just should calm down and forget about this and let's hope it doesn't happen in the future. Um, happy to have you guys joining us on Packer Factor at the end of the summer. Um, I don't need any more players on Empires and Puzzles in my alliance, but you should play the game. It's really good. And uh, if you are a Patreon patron, thank you for your patronage. If you are watching on YouTube, 
link that Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account so we get paid. And remember to re-up it. Just resubscribe every month. It's a one button click. Instructions are in the description of the show. And please follow me on Twitter. My Twitter followers have ticked up a couple hundred. Please follow me on Twitter, at Michael Pactor, just because it's fun. Um, if you don't follow me, don't expect me to ever respond to a direct message or to any questions on, on Twitter. And follow Shane at uh, Dinfire and follow Sifted at Sifted Games. And we will see you next week. And it's like I did that thing on YouTube Live with Keeley, and it's like Packer says PS5 will be 800 bucks. I'm like, yeah. did I actually say that? And I went back and watched it. I'm like, it'll be 800 bucks. And I go, I'm just kidding. They'll, they don't have the balls to charge that. But my God, it got picked up everywhere. Out. No, it got picked up <laughs> everywhere. It's like, oh my God, you, know, you can't even joke anymore.